vacation to the Holy Land with his wife and mother-in-law. That's not the joke. <laughs> the mother-in-law passes away. They go to an undertaker who explains that they can ship her body home, but it will cost $5,000. Whereas they can bury her in the Holy Land for only 150 bucks. The guy says, we'll ship her home. The undertaker asks, are you sure? That's an awfully big expense, and we can do a very nice burial here. The guy says, look, 2,000 years ago, they buried a guy here, and three days later, he rose from the dead. I just can't take that chance. <laughs> social media and he saw that I was preaching today and he saw the title of the sermon, the greatest speech ever given, and he said to me, well, that's pretty presumptuous on your part. And, uh, I said, well, it's not about my speech, so if any of you are thinking that, it's really not about what I'm saying, it's about, you, I'll get there, just give me a few minutes. Um, so, great moments are born from great opportunity. Um, that was a quote from Kurt Russell in the movie Miracle. Anyone ever see the movie Miracle about the 1980 U.S. Olympic hockey team that beat the so-called invincible Russian team. So Kurt Russell goes on to say this. And that's what you have here tonight, boys. This is what he tells the team. A great opportunity. That's what you've earned here tonight. One game. If we play them ten times, they might win nine. But not this game, not tonight. Tonight, we skate with them. Tonight, we stay with them. And we shut them down because we can. Tonight, we are the greatest hockey team in the world. And so they go on to win after hearing one of the greatest speeches ever given. So I think Jesus creates that same opportunity for his disciples in the district of Caesarea Philippi, which we just heard. That's a district that's situated about 25 miles north of the Sea of Galilee. Um, it's at the base of Mount Hermon, and it's located, it's also one of the largest water springs that flows into the Jordan River which drew a lot of folks to that area, uh, religious folks. Um, it was a great place to preach. Uh, so that's why Jesus and his, and his disciples were there. Numerous temples were built in that city. Uh, King Herod built a temple to Caesar Augustus there. So and that's where Jesus asked them, who do the people say the son of humanity is? Disciples say, some say John the Baptist, but others still uh, say Elijah, uh, Jeremiah, and any one of the prophets. That's the word on the street. The word is that Jesus, the son of humanity, is believed to be uh, John or Elijah or Jeremiah. But Jesus goes on to say, but who do you say that I am? He made the question very personal. And Simon Peter answers, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. In a great moment, born from a great opportunity. Peter makes a declaration about Jesus that changes the course of his life and the history of the entire Christian community. It begins with a few heartfelt words spoken at precisely the right moment. It's a great speech. Okay, maybe it wasn't a speech uh, in a technical sense of the word, more like a, a comment, the greatest comment ever made, the greatest answer ever given. But it was great, and maybe the greatest ever. So Peter makes, so what makes Peter's statement so powerful? The greatest of speeches are given, or comments or answers, um, are given in a way that follows this, what's called a homiletical rubric. It's, it's when we take four sides and, and try to put into that the answer we're trying to, to create. So what we use for this statement of Peter is, um, the response. Is it by the right person? Is it at the right moment? With the right vision and the right understanding? So, all this is true for Peter when he makes that declaration. You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And that can be true for us as well. For starters, Peter is the right person. He's not an extraordinary person. He has the same strengths and weaknesses as the other disciples. He will protest forcefully in the near future when Jesus speaks of his suffering and death. He'll stumble badly when he denies Jesus in the night of his crucifixion. 
But because Peter's so very human, so much like any one of us, he has, he, he's the right person to make the declaration about Jesus. Peter also speaks at the right moment. At this point in the Gospel of Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew Jesus is nearing the completion of his ministry in Galilee. Soon he'll head towards Jerusalem and face the suffering and death that awaits him there. But first he needs to make sure that his disciples are clear about who he is and what, and what the community of his followers will look like when he's gone. This time in history of Philippi is the right moment for Peter to speak. When he makes his statement, Peter also has the right vision. He says that Jesus is just not a mere prophet. He's not a man like John or Elijah or Jeremiah and others before him. He's special. Peter sees that Jesus is the Messiah, the one who has been anointed by God to rule. Literally, that's what Messiah means in Hebrew, anointed. A title usually attached to a king. So Peter considers Jesus to be his king. The one who brings the kingdom of God into the middle of human life. On top of this, Peter has the right understanding. He grasps that Jesus is the son of the living God. The one who shows God's divine power and love more clearly than anyone else. In the very next chapter, Peter will hear God's voice boom out of the cloud, confirming the accuracy of his understanding. This is my son, the beloved. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. Jesus is impressed. He's so impressed that he says to Peter, as we heard in the Gospel reading, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. Jesus sees that Peter's declaration is a pure gift of God. And he's thankful for it. You are Peter, he says, and on this rock I will build my church. Jesus gives him a name which means rock, saying that Peter will be the rock on which the Christian church will be built. The gates of Hades will not prevail against it, predicts Jesus. The church will be so strong that death itself will not be able to overcome it. Jesus concludes by giving Peter the keys to the kingdom of heaven with authority to bind and to loose, which means that Peter now has authority to be the chief teacher of the church. The keys of the kingdom are all about teaching, not about who gets through the pearly gates. Peter's given authority to teach in the name of Jesus and to share his grace and truth with the world, just as the church continues to do today. So what can we do to follow the example of Peter in being the right people in the right moments, sharing the right vision and the right understandings? The coach in the movie Miracle says, Great moments are born from great opportunity. Each of us has a great opportunity to play the role of Peter in the world today. Since we share his strengths and weaknesses and have similar opportunities to declare that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. The last three days I've been up in Tampa working, I'm sure if you watch the weather reports, just a torrential amounts of rain up there. And we had one of our storage facilities became flooded. About 100 folks were impacted by that. So for the last few days, all we've done is call folks, have them come out, look at their stuff, and more than not, uh, we open the doors and the stuff is thrown. And we have a team there to throw these things away. And it's very trying time for them and for us, very stressful. So I have to admit, for the last few days, I really wasn't thinking a lot about God or Jesus. I was trying to get through the day. And get these people cleaned out and on to the next one. And we had a woman show up just yesterday. And we opened the door and once again, everything was wet. We looked in, uh, about the waterline on the boxes was about this high, along the entire front. And we looked at the woman and the woman said, praise Jesus. And the manager said, uh, well, um, I don't know if you saw, but it's, it's all wet. You're going to have to throw a lot of this stuff away. And this was her response. And this is how it ties into this sermon today. She looked at us and she said, but the stuff on top's not wet. So I took a step back and I started thinking that I had been thinking about Jesus or God for three days. It wasn't really part of what I was doing. And this woman was the right person at the right moment with the right vision and the right understanding to get me to see what I hadn't seen. 
And I realized that Jesus wants all of me, and not just a Sunday morning week. And that, that happened just yesterday. Um, so I had to believe that this is God at work. This is not something that I wrote down on a piece of paper. Um, so I believe that we are the right people, that, and that Jesus is our Messiah. And I'm sure you agree with that. Uh, we are the health care providers. We know that Jesus is the great physician. We're the soldiers and sealers of honor. Jesus as the Prince of Peace. We are the students and the teachers who grasp that Jesus is the truth. We're even the politicians who see him as king of kings. And even the astrologers who look up to him as the bright morning star. We speak at the right moments. We do. When a child is struggling and needs a word of encouragement, right? When a conflict erupts and can be Confused by a message of reconciliation, we can do that. When a colleague is wandering and needs a word of guidance, and when a friend is dying and needs to hear that Jesus has conquered death, we are the right vision. We have the right vision, and we focus it on Jesus as our sovereign, the one who rules our faith in our life. We look up to Jesus as the one who rules over us with perfect guidance, grace, in love. He is the master we serve with our time. He is the master we serve with our abilities. He's even the master we serve with our money. He is the Lord who gives us direction as we make decisions about relationships, careers, and family life. To say that Jesus is Messiah is to know that we are not alone, that we cannot do this alone. And finally, a right understanding grasps that Jesus is the Son of God living God. We understand him as we stand before him, seeing that he's in a close and intimate relationship with a God who is alive and well and active in our human lives. Because Jesus is God's son who puts a human face on the grace and truth of our creator. When we understand Jesus, we understand God. Peter was given an opportunity to give a speech about Jesus. And it turned into the greatest ever. You are the Messiah, Son of the living God. Ask yourself today, am I the right person? Will I know the right moment? Will I have the right vision? And will it all come together with the right understanding? Peter did not miss his moment. My prayer is that neither should we. Amen.